let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. But especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Bible tells one story. All human communities live out of 
some story that provides a context and gives shape to their lives. If our lives are to be shaped by the story of the Bible, obviously we should know the Bible well. As you know, the Bible starts with the creation story, and it also ends with a creation story. We're not moving towards the destruction of the world, but the recreation of it. In other words, we're going somewhere. And amazingly, you and I are part of that story. For a biblical worldview, we ask ourselves five questions. Who am I? Where am I? What's wrong? What's the solution? And where do I fit into the story? St. Hilda's Church, your church, stands today because of the conviction that the Bible is God's Word. You see, the world needs to see that there's a different model of authority and a different way to live that the Bible teaches. Because the world needs to know that there is a different God. Let me try to explain. You see, what I've come to understand is that when many people in the world today say something like God, it doesn't mean what we would mean by God. You hear this when people say things like, well, it's all the same God that we worship. All religions are alike. But in reality, that meaning of, quote, God doesn't mean the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means either a pantheist God, the God of all being, a sort of nature God, or some kind of spiritual force or energy, or it means a God way up somewhere in the sky who started off being a landlord, then became a absentee landlord, and now is just plain absent. Our job as the church is to tell the world again that the Creator God, who is in authority over the world, the God who speaks through the Bible, is the Father of Jesus, and the God who sends the Holy Spirit, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And therefore, our job is to announce to the world the story of Scripture. It doesn't take much to get us off track. A little deviation here, a little compromise there, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a totally different place from where you started. We are to be firmly rooted in the truth of God's Word. And when I say that, I'm also convinced that, convinced that you cannot separate that from the person of Jesus Christ. The Word made flesh. And I'm not talking about, you know, just being Bible smart, book smart. I'm talking about connection with the Lord Jesus Christ because all of the Bible points to Jesus so that you and me may grow into the character of Jesus. Transformation at its deepest level within our hearts and minds is an end in itself. And so the Word of God is vitally important. Obvious, right? I know I'm speaking to the converted. Knowing God's Word is no secret. There's a simplicity to it. We are to read his word. We are to digest his word. We're trying to understand it. And of course, challenge to live by it. Yes, there is a simplicity, but the question is, how do we do it? I don't know if you remember Monty Python on television, and there's one skit I loved called How to Play the Flute. And in the scoot, someone... In the skit, someone uh, picks up a flute and says, well, here we are. You blow there and you move your fingers up and down here. Next week, we're going to show you how to live, you know, in harmony with all people in the world and something like that. But more seriously, how 
do we become effective students and teachers of God's Word? Well, let's go to the Word of God and find out. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Or actually, starting at verse 14. You are familiar with this passage. It's a good piece of the Bible about the Bible. Verse 14 says this, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have become acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman or child of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is a classic passage about the Bible. The Apostle Paul believes that all scripture, every passage, every book, every sentence, every word of the Word of God from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is profitable for all believers. It's given to all Christians so that they may be built up in faith and for growing in grace. And of course, that includes the Old Testament and the difficult bits. You see, that even surprised the apostles when Jesus taught them that. Remember the conversation on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection? when Jesus basically began to tell Cleopas and his companion that what we know as the Old Testament, Jesus said something like, let me tell you something. This whole book, this whole Old Testament is about me. Luke chapter 24 tells us this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted it to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, wouldn't you have of loved to be part of that Bible study. This whole book is about Jesus Christ. And so if you believe in this book, if you continue in this book, if you persist in this book, if you abide in this book, and eventually you will draw closer to Jesus. That ought to be the goal of every Christian, to live according to the Word of God. Again, I'm preaching to the converted. Every Christian ought to be saying in all the fullness of its meaning with the psalmist that said, how I love your word, O Lord. And I think that's what Paul is saying here, that the Bible shows me my life, what's good, what's bad, and everything in between. It shows me my need. It shows me my Savior. It shows me the way of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it shows me the way to the fullness of life. This book tells me everything I need to know how to live in this world, loving God, and trying to love the people that he created. And so Paul explains why we are to live by the book. First of all, we're to live by the book because the words of the Bible come right out of God's mouth. They are inspired. Secondly, we are to live by this book because it's very practical. And third, we are to live by this book because it tells us how to live for God. So first of all, scripture is inspired. Now we need to stop right there and say that the very, very often that when we say inspired, we mean something different than what Paul is saying here. It reminds me of my time in theological college when students and some teachers at the university started to debate about the doctrine of Scripture and specifically the issue of inspiration. So the question was asked, when you say that the Bible is inspired, what do you think inspiration means? Now, a more liberal mindset would answer something like this. I think the Bible is inspired because it inspires me. Well, sorry to say, that's not what Paul is saying here. Scripture is God's word. They are God-breathed. And that's a more accurate translation of the passage. 
I know some translations use the word inspired. At that time, the rabbinical, the rabbinical teaching was that the Spirit of God rested on and in the prophets and spoke through them so that their words did not come from themselves, but from the mouth of God. And they spoke and wrote in the Holy Spirit. The early church was in entire agreement with that view. Now, it doesn't mean that all scripture is easy to understand. Some parts, and I would say a small percentage, are difficult to understand. But most are pretty easy and straightforward. Again, that reminds me of Mark Twain who said, It ain't those parts of the Bible that I, can, I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. The Apostle Paul reminds us that all scripture is inspired. So as I just said, Paul makes it clear that it's not just the writers of scripture that are inspired or their thoughts that are inspired. It's the words of scripture that are inspired or God breathed. Remember Paul saying to the Thessalonians, I thank God that you received my word, not as the words of men, but for what it really is the word of God. Paul is assuming that scripture in its entirety is God breathed. And so we have a very high view of scripture as Christians. God tells us in his word how we're to think even about his word. Now I don't have to tell you that there are many low views of scripture in the culture around us. And my concern is that this is a very real pressure, especially for our young people, because they are constantly being bombarded by a message of tolerance, where the Bible seems to be at times intolerant. We should not underestimate the power of the media, and our task will be to pray and pass on the importance of Scripture to our young people. Pray, pray, pray for them. I believe the culture around us will increasingly look at the Bible as a collection of religious fairy tales from thousands of years ago. And worse than that, when it starts to challenge that some parts of it are good and other parts of it are dangerous, intolerant, unloving. We need God's grace and his wisdom in the years to come. Now, one of the things I was wondering about was why did the Apostle Paul need to inform Timothy about all of this anyway? I'm pretty sure that Timothy would know of the scripture's inspiration. Well, maybe he just needed to be reminded, like we do from time to time. And so the four functions of scripture in verse 16 cover a wide range from imparting doctrine to challenging behavior and training us in righteousness. These functions are still the valid purpose of the Bible and are vital in equipping the Christian, a term which stands particularly to all Christian teachers, but it's applicable to every single person, including you and me right now. Note the purpose and the significant stress on the thoroughness in preparation for the work of God. So that leads us to our second point. Paul tells us that the Bible is also profitable. It's useful, it's beneficial. And again, Paul is stating the obvious. You wouldn't think it very profound if I would say something like gasoline, or nowadays a very large bar battery, is relevant to the running of an automobile engine. You'd think, you're wasting my time because you're stating the obvious. The Bible is not only relevant, it is absolutely essential. An important aspect is the function of Scripture to make us wise for salvation. And this could be abundantly illustrated from the many times in which Paul in his letter, appeals to Scripture in his expositions of God's work of salvation in the Lord Jesus. 
So take a look at the book of Romans one day and see how many references there are from the prophet Isaiah and the book of Psalms. It's absolutely essential that we think of ourselves as lifelong learners of the Bible because Paul says it's practical for teaching, for instruction, for imparting the truth. He says that it's practical for reproof or admonition, for warning us against the errors that we're liable to make. It's practical for correction, for redirecting us, the positive side of warning, for rectification of wrong beliefs and wrong conduct. It's practical for teaching in righteousness, for discipline, for discipling, and preparing you and me in godliness. The Bible is practical inherently, and the only reason we don't always think the Bible is practical is because sometimes we get distracted and interested in other things rather than what God is telling us through his word. And so we need to daily be reading the Bible. Again, I'm preaching to the converted. And third, the Bible is sufficient. Notice that verse 17 says that the Bible is not only inspired and practical, it's sufficient to prepare us for a life of godliness and every good work. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And I like the description of the word equipped. It means completely outfitted, fully furnished, fully equipped, and supplied. And that word was also used for a boat completely outfitted for rescue. In other words, Paul is saying that the aim is not that we just know the facts about the Bible, not even simply that we will assent to the proper doctrines that are taught in the Bible, which of course are essential. It's equip us for service, which includes the rescue of lost and hurt people. That's what we want to be about. Like usual, I'm just reminding us of the obvious. So let me close with a bit of a meditation. I'll read the passage again. And as I read the, uh, the passage, let's, let me remind you of those five questions that I began with. And after I read it, I'll read uh, uh, the, those five questions. So again, let's pray. Father, again, as we look into your word, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, even now, as we think about the word of God and how it relates to us today. So, but as for you, St. Hildas, and each individual person watching today, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so for a, a biblical worldview, we ask ourselves a couple of questions. Who am I? Where am I? What's wrong? What is the solution? And where do I fit into the story? And so, Father, as we reflect on these questions, we pray that even now you would give in us a zeal for your word, that it would burn within us, 
that we would be reminded often to reflect on, to think about the Word of God, and especially the Word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we bless you, Lord, today, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.